what a way for a game in rivalry week to go. Harrison Barnes getting his revenge on his former team, the Golden State Warriors, going for a career high 39 points. This is coming off of a 32 point game against the Hawks. I just don't understand this man. He has all of a sudden decided to turn into prime Harrison Barnes. He was amazing the very first game of the season and then horrible the next 40 whatever. And then now he's been amazing again. Like he was great game one and then he was great game one of the second half of the season. And now he's carried that over. I bet it felt really good for him to have this type of game against the Warriors. I feel like it's been a long time coming for him. But I also think this was just a big game for the Kings to win in general. Coming off a four-game losing streak, bouncing back and getting one win against the Atlanta Hawks. But then to build on that win, going into this big seven-game road trip. I think it's huge to start off on the right foot against the Warriors. A very winnable game, obviously. And coming out and, and putting together a good performance. A great performance offensively and a good enough performance defensively to win this game. And there are pre plenty of defensive problems. We'll talk about them. But they got it done. And, and almost choked it again to free throws. Almost did it again. Kevin Herter missing both free throws. Like if, if, if they lost another game to free throws, I don't even know what I would have done. Like... Uh, just that would have been awful and I feel bad because Kevin Herter you know he also missed a three that would have put us ahead too but then he was the guy who assisted Sabonis for the go-ahead dunk and he was the guy who also was huge in getting the stop on Steph Curry so he was really good in other ways uh, down the stretch just not in terms of shooting the ball and you know he was one of the best clutch three-point shooters last year which was always a stat that kind of surprised me because he doesn't really strike me as a guy that's that's super clutch. And obviously, we kind of know what happened in the playoffs. But other than those moments, he had a really solid game. But it truly was Harrison Barnes who kept like bailing the Kings out of not necessarily bad offensive possessions, but bailing us out after just allowing scores on the other end too easily of barely keeping us ahead, and sometimes when the offense would stagnate, we'd go to him. And last year, that's something I found myself saying time and time again, is when the offense stagnates, Harrison Barnes would find a way to get a bucket. He would find a way to get to the free throw line, and that's what he's been doing these past two games. Obviously, shooting 7 for 12 from the free throw line, I mean three-point line, is amazing. And that helps a lot, you know, 21 points right there. But it's the other ways he's scoring it's in the mid-range, but especially getting to the rim. And I think for the Kings as a whole, I kind of said after the Hawks game, it's a win, but it's not a win that gives me a whole lot of confidence going forward. I think this game is different. It's a win and it does give me confidence going forward. And obviously you can look at the three-point shooting. We go 22 for 48. So if you shoot that well from three, you expect to win, but it's not the three-point shooting. It's everything else about how the offense looked. And maybe it is about when the shots are falling, then the Kings kind of get that confidence and they start moving the ball and moving without the ball really well. But you saw it from the very start, the energy that they were playing with. Because you look at the other side and... The Warriors shot over 50% from three, 19 for 37. So both teams having incredible shooting games. It would be one thing if the Warriors shot 35% from three and the Kings were up at 46% and it's a one point win. You know, that's different. But the Warriors shot better from three point range and the Kings were still able to win the game. The Warriors were shooting 60% from three at halftime and the Kings had a lead and the Kings were able to maintain a lead throughout almost the entire game. The Warriors would get really close, sometimes tie the game up, but the Kings would always have a response. I think the guy that kind of started everything offensively, I don't think it was Harrison Barnes. I think it was DeMontis Sabonis who was really at the center of everything good offensively that was happening. And we've seen in the past the way the ways that he struggled against the Warriors. 
but he didn't look like he was forcing anything out there. It didn't look like he was in his head thinking about what shots he should take, thinking about the space that they were giving him so he should take advantage of it. It looked like he was just not even thinking out there. It looked like he was just playing. And that's that's when everyone plays at their best, when they're not thinking, when they're not overthinking things. And for him, yeah, they're going to give him space. He's not going to take that shot every time. But when he's in rhythm and he feels like it's within the flow of the offense, then he will take that shot. So he took that nice free throw line jumper off of, was it a Kevin Herter assist maybe on the pick and roll? That was important. And then him just also scoring inside and really just being able to play Kevon Looney off the court, which was key, which was obviously not something we saw in the playoffs. And it's not something that we've really seen in other games against the Warriors. So that was a very good sign. He was also knocking down his threes because if they're going to give him wide open threes, I mean, he can knock down wide open threes. He went two for two. Obviously, you're not expecting you know him to make go two for two every game necessarily but every game he's going to take one or two threes when he's wide open and he's been shooting them at a great clip this season so far and just everything good about the king's offense was getting him in the middle of the floor and then him making decisions from there Uh, the warriors starting dario saric and kavan looney together but neither of them could do anything against the bonus and then you had draymond green coming off the bench And again, he couldn't really stop Sabonis either. He drew one charge, and that was about the extent of the amount of stops that the Warriors got on him. But obviously what we didn't see in the playoffs and why Sabonis got even more of a bad rap than he deserved was shooters actually making shots, and that's extremely important. When he is at the center of everything and he's dishing out to open shooters, they need to be able to make shots, and they did in this game. With everyone in the starting lineup making at least two threes, including himself, you had Keegan Murray go two for seven, Fox three for seven, uh, and Herter three for eight. And then the time you really knew that it was just going to be a a totally offensive game from really both teams was when the bench came in for the Kings and Davion Mitchell, who's been getting back into the rotation lately, he comes in and he just starts splashing threes. He goes three for five. I think he hit his first three threes and had 10 points leading all Kings scores off the bench. Trey Lyles came in, I believe hit his first two threes, ended up going two for four. And so everyone was just hitting from deep. And then from the Warriors side, you had Dario Saric going four for four. You had Wiggins going two for three. Obviously Steph and Clay hitting a few, but then you have Kaminga going two for four. You have Corey Joseph going two for two. Pajemski going one for two, right? So these are not things that you totally expect all the time from both teams, from players that you just wouldn't really expect. Everyone had it going from deep. The Kings built up a a solid lead through that shooting in the first quarter, but then Steph got going. And the Kings just gave Steph way too many open looks. And he went off for, I think it was 18 points in the first quarter. And the way it went, it was like open shots at first, And then the Kings key in on him, and then he's making the tougher shots. And that's the problem. You can't give him those open shots to start because that builds the confidence. And the same goes for any player, but obviously especially Steph. They started off with Fox guarding Steph, and that didn't go too well. And there were multiple moments where Keegan would kind of get switched off onto him, and then Keegan wouldn't totally get out to the three-point line. And I just thought the Kings as a whole had to do a much better job communicating and running him off the three-point line. It's like the last few shots of the first quarter. It's like there's nothing you can do, but it's about stopping him getting those initial open looks because it's impossible to guard the Warriors as a whole once Steph gets going and he's a one-man offense. And so what you saw the Kings do, they put Keegan Murray on him and Keegan did a really solid job on Steph. I think with Keegan, we've seen so much defensive growth, but I think there's still a lot of room for him to grow as a second-year player. There's still a lot of moments where I think you see him not totally making the right decision or not being decisive enough, especially when it comes to what to do around screens, both screen navigation and like when to switch. And so he did a solid job, but definitely wasn't perfect. And I think that's totally reasonable for a second-year player to not have it, you know, 
totally together in on the defensive end. And obviously, Steph Curry is a, a special type of player that you have to defend. So it just, any slight flaw you have, he exploits that. And the Kings have a lot of these little flaws just as a whole, and he exploits all of them. The main problem with the Kings trying to defend the Warriors was they only have, the Kings only have one Keegan Murray. And so Jonathan Kaminga really is the key for the Warriors because Keegan having to defend Steph means Keegan is not defending Jonathan Kaminga. And that just poses an insane matchup problem because it's like, who do you put on Kaminga? And, and when Wiggins is playing well, it's who do you play on, put on Wiggins as well? And Wiggins usually has good games against the Kings because of this reason. Like Kaminga has been having good games recently just against everyone, but Wiggins has been really poor this season, but he has good games against the Kings because it's Harrison Barnes that has to guard him. Or it's Kevin Herter who's just uh, too small for him. And so you had Wiggins going 6 for 8, 17 points. Kaminga 12 for 19 with 31 points. And there were a lot of those moments where it'd be Kaminga screening for Curry. And then it's like, what do you do? Do you have Keegan try to stay with Steph? Do you have him try to switch? Or sometimes it was even the other way around where Keegan would be guarding the screener, Kaminga, most of the time. And then it's like, do you switch? We had Lyles guarding Kaminga for a good amount of the time that Trey was on the floor. And there were just a lot of those moments where it's Keegan trying to chase Curry over the screen and Curry can go straight to the basket. And then Trey Lyles doesn't want to, you know, help off Kaminga or the other way around Steph screening for Kaminga. And then Keegan doesn't want to help onto Kaminga because obviously you don't want to leave Steph, but what's Trey Lyles supposed to do? He can't get under the screen that quickly, not against Kaminga, who's super athletic. And so it just results in Kaminga getting to the rim. So that was the biggest problem for the Kings defensively. And it's just highlighting the weakness of the Kings need for more wing defense. And the Kings went small to try to combat this problem. We didn't see any JaVale McGee. We didn't see any Alex Len. It was Trey Lyles at the five off the bench the entire time. We saw Chris Duarte in the first half three minutes they didn't like what they saw from him so it's Kessler Edwards who I thought did a better job played six minutes in the second half and so against this Warriors team it's always going to be really hard just with the personnel that the Kings have but there were definitely moments where the Kings could have done better like I said early in the first quarter just leaving Steph uh, in some moments kind of inexcusably moments where Clay Thompson just gets open off an inbounds play too easily. Fox fouled him for the four-point play. The worst one was definitely down the stretch when it was a five-point game, I believe 132-127, and somebody drives. I don't remember who it is, but they draw bodies. But Fox is able to find Curry at the top of the three-point line. So that's fine. We did a good job of defending that, and we forced the kick out, but then Fox just totally lost Curry. And it's like, in that situation, you just can't do that because he's not even helping on anyone else. That was a killer. And I thought that, like, if we lost this game, you're probably pointing to that play. The Warriors just, they require you to be communicating at all times at such a high level. And so it, it definitely makes it tough. But the Kings were pushing the pace from the get-go. And that's something that, you know, Mike Brown, he's never going to shy away from pushing the pace with this team. It doesn't matter who you're playing against. He wants pace, pace, pace. And Fox was big in pushing the pace. And Fox looked a little bit more like himself in this one. He wasn't settling for the long-range shots early on. He was getting to his spots in the very short mid-range area and getting those to go down. Had a very efficient night, 9 for 16. It wasn't just him chucking from the three-point line or kind of barreling inside trying to get a foul call. It seemed much more in control and much more like what he is good at and what he thrives at, which is getting to that mid-range. I think the most important moments for the Kings were when the Warriors would go on a run or they would hit a hit a three and then the Kings would just push it right back into them. And Fox is so good at pushing the pace and just hitting, hitting those killer threes. He did it in the playoffs. He does it a lot. We haven't seen him do that recently. 
And so it was nice to see him do that in this game where he pushes the pace, either gets to the foul line or hits that killer three. And he, he just looked more like himself, which is really good to see. You know, I think, I think plus minus the stat plus minus, it can be useful, not necessarily for evaluating individual players, but for kind of telling a story of the game. And so you see Fox played a really good game, but he's a minus 12. And then you have Sabonis at a plus eight, Keegan at a, a plus 11. And so I think that really matches the eye test when it comes to what lineups were working and what weren't. When Sabonis was off the floor, the offense was just not good. Because when Sabonis is off the floor, especially when the Kings aren't playing a traditional center, like when they don't play a traditional center, sure, it, it spaces the floor, but it requires the Kings to be hitting their threes. And it requires both Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox to be getting penetration. And it's harder to do that without a traditional center setting screens. And so when Malik Monk has a bad game, you see a lot of times in those lineups, you know, Fox isn't the primary ball handler, but he'll be out there. And so it's a lot on Malik Monk to create, and he didn't have a good game. And so when he's not having a good game, it's going to be tough for the bench. And I think you see a lot of great moments when Monk is able to run the pick and roll with an Alex Len or a JaVale McGee, but when he doesn't have that, he kind of struggles a bit. And so without DeMontis Sabonis at the center, it's just a lot more dribbling, passing around the perimeter, a lot less getting into the paint and forcing shifts from the defense. And the Sabonis and Curry minutes, they matched up a lot. And so obviously you want to take advantage of the non-Curry minutes, but the non-Curry minutes also being non-Sabonis minutes meant it was really just kind of just try to keep the lead or just survive. Don't give up the lead in those non-Sabonis minutes. And Harrison Barnes was super key to that. Taking the pressure off of De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk to create and creating for himself. Because there was a moment specifically at the start of the second quarter when Sabonis was out. It was when they tried to put Duarte in. Duarte kind of just got blown by immediately. But Warriors are going on a bit of a run here. There were some bad, bad shots from the Kings. And Harrison Barnes just posts up and gets to the free throw line. And that's what we saw so much of last season, but we just haven't seen that at all this season. And so if he can consistently do that in those moments where the offense is stagnating, if he can consistently get himself baskets or get himself to the free throw line, that would be huge. And him getting to the free throw line is also one of the reasons our free throw percentage has been better in recent games. We'd only missed one free throw up to the moment when Kevin Herter missed those last two free throws. It was Davion, Davion Mitchell going one for two. Darren Fox went eight for eight from the foul line in this one. But I think that's what Barnes did the best, was just helping the Kings survive the non-Sabonis minutes. The end of the first half was definitely a little frustrating because it felt like some calls were just not going the Kings' way, going straight up. Just... The challenge that uh, Mike Brown lost, where Sabonis and Kaminga are just both meeting at the ball, meeting at the spot, and somehow Sabonis gets called for a foul. I mean, it, it just that's that's an easy no call right there. And there were more moments like Kaminga just getting the star whistle, where it felt like guys were going straight up, and there was some foul trouble for Fox early on, Sabonis, uh, Herder, and there. Were, there was definitely a bit of a meltdown defensively near the end of the second. I thought there were some bad moments from Kevin Herter, particularly at the end of the second where we're like midway through to the end of the second where he was biting on pump fakes, not really rotating correctly, not digging down on Kavon Looney correctly. And so I just thought it was kind of a an up and down game for Herter defensively. He definitely had some good moments of getting his hands in the passing lanes. He had three steals. He was really good on the boards. Ten rebounds, seven defensive, three offensive rebounds. The Kings had some really key offensive rebounds, and he was a big part of that. Davion also had a, a big offensive rebound. Barnes had one as well. But then there were also some other moments from Herder, like down the stretch, where he just was not able to contain Curry, and Curry just went right by him. Keegan had one of those moments as well. But then you saw like a very similar play at the, you know, the last play of the game and Herter 
made up for not getting in front of Curry by getting in front of Curry on this one and totally bottling him up. And then Fox was able to get the steal for the win. And so that's what I mean. It was just kind of up and down. There were some bad moments. There's some good moments from Herter defensively. And I don't expect them to be perfect. But I thought it was a good effort from him. In the third quarter, both teams definitely slowed down from the three-point line a bit. But I thought the Kings, for the most part, had a good spread of like taking the open three-point shots, but not totally relying on the three-point shot. There was a moment where the Kings went up like seven or eight, and then they, they just chucked two really bad three-point attempts. And the Warriors go down, score off of both of those misses, and the lead is down to two in an instant. And I feel like those are the moments that you just can't have. And so it's like slight mental lapses or those moments where you're just kind of like you're trying to hit the home run. And Mike Brown is all about hitting singles. And those three point attempts are the ones where you're just kind of trying to break the other team and just break the game wide open. Whereas if you just keep hitting the singles, you force the other team to try to make those big plays. And so that's when Barnes stepped in and kept the lead by just going to the mid-range. And he was going right at Dario Saric all game. He was going right at Klay Thompson when Klay Thompson got switched onto him. I mean, that was a big advantage for Barnes to be able to go up, up against a guy like Dario Saric or Klay Thompson. But the thing is, like, that's what Barnes can do on most nights because the other team's defensive players, they're all worried about Fox, obviously Sabonis, Keegan, and even Herder. And so sometimes you're getting like the third worst wing defender, which is like the, the worst wing defender on the other team that's guarding him. And so he has to be able to take advantage of those mismatches. And lately he's been doing a great job of that. Sadiq Bey in Atlanta, Dario Sarge here. Steph and Clay were making some tough shots for the Warriors to kind of keep a minute in that third quarter. More great minutes from Davion. I kind of talked after last game how Davion played really well, but I didn't really believe in it going forward. And, you know, I'm not saying that I believe in it now, but him stringing two games together and obviously being able to actually hit from the three-point line, that's huge. And I thought his defense was really good. He pulled the chair on Clay Thompson, which was so funny. And then getting on the, the glass. But at the end of the third quarter, it definitely felt like it could have spiraled a little bit with Monk having a bad game, turning the ball over without Sabonis. It would Kessler Edwards in there. And it's like, ooh, this could this could go poorly. But it was Harrison Barnes again saving the day. And so the Kings just survived those non-Sabonis minutes. And then at the start of the fourth, they actually started building a lead, even without Sabonis, because Fox and Monk were getting in the lane. They were finding Trey Lyles in the dunker spot. But then on the other end, they were getting hurt by trying to put Trey Lyles on Jonathan Kaminga. I feel like in, in those moments without Sabonis, Fox does need to get a little more involved. Not not taking the ball on every possession or anything like that, but just a little more involved from him in moments where the offense is stalling a bit. Or at least in, you know, in possessions where you've gone 15 seconds with nothing, that's when you need to find Fox for those moments. Because Fox is one of the best in terms of scoring really late into shot clocks. Sabonis came back in, but there have been so many moments where this season the Kings, in the fourth quarter, they go away from what's working. And what's working is Sabonis facilitating everything from the middle of the court. And so the, again, it was Monk over dribbling, not getting the ball to Sabonis, just trying to take screens from Sabonis. And it just wasn't working. Monk only played 19 minutes in this game and they pulled him. And so then they got back to playing through Domas, which is exactly what they needed to do. They really just tried to play the last 12 minutes of the game completely differently than the first 36 minutes and it's hurt them a lot this season and so it was good to see them make an adjustment and go back to what was working curry got it going again in the fourth after not really doing too much since the first quarter like keegan was playing some solid defense and curry was making tough shots but fox was right there to push the pace right back and hitting big shots one one negative about Harrison Barnes 
being on fire offensively is that then he has to be out there in crunch time. And I mean, at this point, there's not really anyone else you could put out there defensively, but like, it's not good for him to be out there guarding Jonathan Kaminga in crunch time. I mean, but who do you go to? Cause Trey Lyles wasn't any better. So do you put Davion out there and go smaller? Do you go to Kessler Edwards? Like, I don't know. You don't really have options personnel wise. And so the Warriors were just able to get to the rim. And there was that play that I talked about. Curry getting open. Again, Barnes keeping us in it despite bad defense or keeping the lead with his mid-rangers. And there's that huge spell of offensive rebounding. I call it a spell of offensive rebounding because we didn't really get the offensive rebound. But it was just kind of getting batted around. And then Curry was out of bounds when he caught it. And so we got the ball back with like 24 seconds. Herter was able to get the ball, made a really nice play to Sabonis inside for the dunk where we had a one-point lead. And then it was a very interesting play because, again, Harrison Barnes gets on Jonathan Kaminga and his screen navigation was terrible coming down the baseline. And he, like, Kaminga had so much space, he could have just stopped under the rim, caught it, and probably dunked it. But he obviously didn't realize how far behind Harrison Barnes is and, you know, uh, other players, you know, they don't watch the Kings every game. They don't know how bad Harrison Barnes screen navigation is. So it gave enough time for Barnes to recover just barely. And then Sabonis was there to help. And they were able to force the like block slash just turnover. And then you always obviously had the herder missed free throws. Warriors don't call timeout. Curry just dribbling around, which is best case scenario, because once, like, like if Jonathan Kaminga goes to the paint, I feel like bad things are happening for the Kings there. Like, I don't see how the Kings are defending Kaminga. He had space. He could have gone to the paint, but he just gave it to Curry, and the Kings were able to send bodies at Curry. Keegan got screened off Curry, but Fox then switched onto him, and Herder was able to blitz him, and they were able to force the turnover. A very stressful final sequence, but once I saw Curry kind of get just turned around and pushed back out near half court with like four seconds left, I was feeling pretty good. And it was nice to not have to have the stress of the ball going through the air, even if it was a tough shot. You know, them not getting a shot, that makes it a lot less stressful. It's just really good to see the Kings offense from last season kind of showing a little bit more here. And it's all about Harrison Barnes being more aggressive. And it's about Kevin Herter playing with confidence. Those two guys are the key. And the Kings starting lineup has been great all season. They've had one of the better net ratings in the league for starting lineups. And that's without Barnes playing well. And that's without Herter playing well for large chunks of the season. And so if we can get a little more consistency out of them, that would be huge. And I think even if the Kings don't go for the big swing at the trade deadline and trade for a a starting caliber wing player or like a a third option kind of wing player, I think just getting one more defensive wing on this team, just no matter who it is, just any playable defensive wing is just going to make this team so much better because it would allow them to actually put someone out there on a Jonathan Kaminga who has a chance to guard him or an Andrew Wiggins. And so someone like a Royce O'Neal, who the Kings have been rumored with uh, recently. Like I said at the start, I think it was really important for the Kings to get off to a, a good start on this road trip. The next game, they go to Dallas. Obviously, Dallas is a very solid team, but they will be on the second night of a back-to-back, just like the Warriors were in this one. So that's a positive. I didn't uh, mention it, but Sasha Bezenkov, uh, who twisted his ankle in the last game, he was out and he will be out for a week or two, or he'll be reevaluated in a week or two. The Mavericks are in the midst of a, a pretty tough schedule. Not this next game where they play the Hawks. It's kind of funny. The Kings played the Hawks. Then the Hawks go to Golden State, play Golden State. Then the Kings play Golden State. Then the Hawks go to Dallas, play Dallas. Or actually, I think uh, that's in Atlanta. But either way, you know, the Hawks playing Dallas and the Kings go play Dallas. 
But uh, yeah, the Mavs have lost for their last five games against some tough teams. The Kings won the first matchup pretty handily, and that one was also in Dallas. Kyrie Irving is questionable, I believe, coming into this game. I, I believe he missed their last game, but they said it wasn't super serious and he wasn't going to miss a bunch of time. So I feel like he'll probably be back. But last time the Kings played the Mavs, it was all about DeMontis Sabonis dominating inside because the Mavs just don't really have great centers. Derek Lively, their rookie, is their starting center. And so they're just kind of small and they don't have the a big, strong guy to match up against Sabonis. And so hopefully, again, we can see him dominating inside. Anyways, that is it for this episode of The Roll Report. I will be back on Saturday to recap the game against the Mavs. I guess at this point of the season, I kind of also got to say, if any trades go down, if there's any moves like that, I'll also be back. We're getting into that time of year. And so I will see you guys then. Peace.